unto you for your people, Lord God. Amen. Sermon is Acts 10, 9, 10 to 19. I'll read that. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. That's what people always call my kid. It's not. It's Ananias. Totally side comment. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight and a house of Judas to look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him, and he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he arose and was baptized. And taking food, he was strengthened. For some days, he was with the disciples at Damascus. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. All right, so in the previous verses uh, that we discussed, I think a lot of American evangelicals would resonate with that, the private experience and private encounter before God. But notice something that even though um, Paul or Saul at this point had his divine encounter, he's still blind. He's still blind until this happens here. Saul would not become Paul if he merely just had an encounter with God on the road and not what we're about to go through very slowly here. And why is this important? Why is Paul's scales falling off, not on the road, but as he goes to put himself under the authority of a church, important? Because we live in the city of Miami. It is a city which revels in rogue, lone ranger Christianity. And even when we do have church in Miami, we have a lot of times the anti-church church church in Miami. I see where I I see the internet. I see the anti-church church church in Miami. You know, it's like we are gathered, but we're anti-church. So it's kind of like we're we're like gathered as a bunch of lone rangers that are calling ourselves an anti-church church. church. Um, But what we see here is that Saul's turn to Paul's through the local church as the means to make him holistically well. I'm going to read something to you that may may make some of you feel uncomfortable. Look at the Westminster Confession says about the church in 25.2. And it is, talking about the church, the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, the house and family of God, out of which there is no ordinary possibility of salvation. Say, are you saying that people can't be actually saved and not be part of a church? That's not the point. The point is the Bible does not know of this Christian who is not a part of a church. It doesn't recognize that person. You know what I'm saying? You can be actually a Christian but, in the church, but, but the Bible doesn't speak about you. The church and Christianity are like pan y bite, you know what I'm saying? Like coffee and milk, I suppose you can separate them, but the Bible doesn't speak about them as such. So one of the important things we're going to understand about advancing the kingdom of God is simply to always do so with the church, with the church. That's my main thought. So Paul sends him in verse 10 to a disciple in Damascus named Ananias and is here where he hears from him and he is baptized by him and he becomes 
Paul, not by the Paul who sees, not by just having a God encounter on the road by himself, but by submitting himself to the authority of someone in the church that was. So his condition of blindness remains until he subjects himself to the local church that he was persecuting. You want to know why there's so many Christians who know Jesus, but they're still very blinded and very confused? Because they have not transitioned to subjecting themselves to a local body to give them that clarity of sight that they need that happens only in that local body. So Christian sight and subjection to the church go hand and ham. And every true advancement of the gospel will go hand in hand with this reality. All that God does, essentially and most definitively, is not through a bunch of privatized, I saw God encounters, but through the local assembly with his people. So if you ever find somebody advancing the church by either assaulting the visible church and or negating the visible church, you can be sure that's not a movement of God. It's not a movement of God when you seek to advance the cause of God outside of the church. Where his scales fall from his eyes is when he encounters the church. And this is important because we have a lot of IG pastors. Instagram for you older folks. You know. Facebook, YouTube pastors, podcast pastors that are acting like a church when they're just some person that has technology. You know, it's or you have like the, the I'm going to do my own church thing by myself kind of thing, you know, in Miami. Um, you know what's funny? Like none of y'all go to lawyers that become lawyers that way. None of you go to doctors that become doctors that way. But y'all go to a church by someone who does that. You have a higher view of a lawyer and a doctor than a minister of the gospel. That's probably why, or maybe you're just confused. Paul needed the ministry of the church to go from Saul to Paul. He did not need to become a self-pastored person. In order for him to be turned and sent, he has to go down to this place where a disciple of the church is and administers a sign of the church. See, see, Paul you know a whole lot. You've read a whole lot. Now it's time for you to shut your mouth, listen, and put yourself under the church. And I would say the same thing to many. How ironic it is that the institution that he hated and was persecuting is the one he needs the most. How humbling is this? So... The I saw God by myself encounters, the, you know, the, the revivalistic anti-church, you know, encounters, you know, the um, solo ranger kind of like force for Jesus things and um, the parachurch that's not the church but acts like the church, but they're not the church, but they act like the church. Um, um, those are not the things that we see here that God uses to bring Saul to Hey, Paul, see, Jesus gave the keys of the kingdom to the local church. Okay, the apostles passed those keys to the elders they appoint. So, you know, I talk a lot, a lot, a lot of times I hear young men talk about ministry. You want to, you, and, and they, go, they go to seminary, okay? These guys go to seminary, um, and it's like, oh, I'm, go, I'm going to seminary because I want to be a pastor. I was like, Okay, cool. Um, what local church told you that you should be a pastor and sent you here? Oh, no, I, I never had that happen to me. Oh, I see. So you sent yourself, and you have a call all by yourself. Well, guess what? The Grand Apostle Paul got sent to a local church member who was well-known, and he put himself under the authority of a local church before he ever gets sent out as the apostle Paul, you want to pursue ministry? Then put yourself deeply in the accountability of a local church. You know, church member, do you want direction in your life? Put yourself deeply under the accountability of a local church as opposed to, I'm going to encounter God by, you know, 
the Lectio Divinia experience of God where I just walk around and I just, you know, have all these like, you know, autonomous, isolated God. And, no, no. You want to know God's direction in your life? Put yourself in a local church, in a local body with accountability, and that's where God will give you much more clarity from your scales. And you can, by all means, enjoy God personally and privately, but this is very instructive for us. This is why the Westminster Confession of Faith says that the visible church is the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ and the house and family of God. And then in number three of that same section, it says, unto this Catholic Universal, okay, I have to say that because you guys maybe forget. Catholic means universal, visible church. Christ has given the ministry oracles and ordinances. So God gave the church ministry oracles and ordinances. That's the promises, the signs, and the ministry for the gathering and perfecting of the saints. God gave the church the things necessary to gather people and perfect them. So God is very much about making this Saul to Paul story very, very, very much entrenched in the church. But not just the church, but a church that has God confidence. The Lord, Lord, Ananias answered in verse 13, I have heard from many people about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has authority from here from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go. For this man is my chosen instrument to take my name to Gentiles, kings, and to Israelites. So Ananias starts the conversation with God with talking about the Apostle Paul's qualities or lack thereof. And Ananias is like probably thinking like, this guy was coming here for me and my church. And you want me to go over there and have like a a come to Jesus meeting. Um, And he starts talking about Saul's attributes. And notice that God doesn't say, don't worry, I already changed them on the road. Doesn't tell him that. They said, don't worry, Saul is not as bad as you think he is. Don't worry. Don't worry. um, I struck him off his horse. God talks to him about himself. God talks to Ananias about himself and his sovereign, supernatural will and his ability to overcome and summon those who are against him. Reminds him that God is a conqueror who, because of who he is, subdues those who oppose him. Don't worry about you, Ananias, and don't worry about Paul. All you need to know is who I am and what I am capable of. And this is why the Apostle Paul talks about a sovereign God who was the X factor. Look at what he says in Galatians 1.14. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people, so extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. But when I decided to follow Jesus, but when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace. See, Paul decided nothing but God decided something, and therefore his will and ways was sovereignly conquered by God's sovereign choice. See, man is corrupt, but God is holy and sovereign, and he can, from his holy power, take that which is corrupt and give that which is the opposite in regeneration. I will take that heart of stone and I will work with it and I will, you know, make it a little, I will take that heart of stone and I will give you a heart of flesh and I will write my law on your heart. Man is dark, but God is light and there is no darkness in him and he has a power to call out of the darkness lights where there is no light. That's what he says in 2 Corinthians. 
right? Paul knows this. He says, let, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give a light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Man is under, under the control of the devil naturally, but God is self-existent and from himself and totally free, and therefore he can free those who are in bondage. Man is spiritually dead, but God is the living God who calls the dead to life. You want a picture of your redemption? Look at John 11. Four days he stinks. The call of God who is life brings the dead out of the tomb by the virtue of that powerful commanding call that comes from the life of God himself. Go because of me and who I am to Saul's. See, and God speaks in Genesis, it so is. And so, God calls the church to approach man with a high view of God, not a high view of man. The tendency for us is to elevate nature and think that how a man is naturally is the most decisive thing. And so let's, let's, let's accommodate a Sauline kind of Christianity because of Saul's natural Saulness. And so we will dumb down theology a bit because of how man naturally is, okay? We will cater to man's nature and what he loves naturally and who he is naturally because of this high view of man and this low view of God. We will speak to man on his terms, accommodating to the culture, and we, or we will use humanistic resources and ways to find man. But if God is the one who calls based upon himself, beloved, we don't have to do anything in any way that caters to man because we know that God and who he is gives us a confidence that is supreme and more superior than anything that we see in any single person's depravity. God's character is way more powerful than that which is lacking in anyone's character. So we don't have to accommodate. We don't have to adjust. We don't have to be selective. We don't have to watch what we say. We don't have to not ask certain hard questions. We don't have to not go there because God calls based upon what is true in himself, irrespective of what is contrary in anything or anyone outside of himself. We must have God confidence. This is why Paul preached the way he did. Look what Paul says in chapter 1. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus. So how is Paul going to preach to the Corinthians in light of the fact that it is only because of God that they are in him? Well, right afterwards, when I came to you, brothers, I did not come to you proclaiming the testimony of God with lofty speech and wisdom. I didn't come talking to you with all the modern-day religious jargon. I, I, didn't, I, I didn't come to you with all the terminology the culture demands. How did I come to you? I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and power so that your faith might not rest on the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. When you know that God himself is the reason why anyone is saved, you speak boldly, unequivocally truth, and you don't compromise, you don't cater, you don't diminish because you know that man is saved because God is sovereign. Not because man is capable. So, oh, that whole, that whole God is sovereign doctrine is such a, that's, a, that's for eggheads like you, Aldo, that's for, you know, um, that's divisive. No, it's not. A high view of God's power is what the church does to advance the gospel. 
We look at people who eat people for breakfast. We look at cannibals. We look at demon worshipers and we say, God is sovereign. And if he wants you, that's it. So we don't got to equivocate. We don't got to dumb down stuff. We preach the truth because we know that God calls in accordance to who he is. So the reason why Ananias can go with this dude who is coming over there for him is because God says, I have chosen him. I have chosen him. And let me just talk to you, beloved, too. We're always making excuses about sin in your life. God chose you for holiness. Stop making excuses like you chose yourself for this thing, and therefore you can kind of like make excuses for why you cannot grow in a certain area. You didn't call yourself. You didn't summon yourself. You were summoned by God. And because God summoned you sovereignly, you can say no to the things in your life that displease him. And you can grow in grace, in godliness. Because you were called by a sovereign, omnipotent, almighty God. You did not call yourself according to yourself. You were called by God. And you were prepared beforehand for good works to walk in them. So you, because you're called by God. You have no excuses. No excuses. He who began a good work in you will finish it. He began, he'll finish it, so stop making excuses for why you cannot grow in it. Church with a God confidence, and also notice something, a church with kingdom-mindedness. Kingdom-mindedness. The Lord said to him, go, for this man is my chosen instrument to take my name to Gentiles, kings, and Israelites. People, groups, nations, and kings. Not, here's Saul, and he's going to come Paul, and, and, and he's just going to go from being a negative guy to a positive guy. You know, he's going to go um, from, you know, lost to saved. No, he... This calling of Paul is about cosmic, global, national, sovereign dominance. I mean, this is a big thing. This conversion of Paul is not simply about a person finding Jesus and then telling his story. This is about the conquest of the Lord in the nations. It's interesting how um, this language is about Saul's calling um, is from Psalms 2. Nations, kings, Gentiles, look at Psalms 2 says, in verse 7, I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make some individuals here and there randomly, this little remnant that will be, you know, itty, itty, itty bitty, bitty, itty bitty, tiny, little, itty, itty bitty. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your inheritance. He didn't mean that, so, right? Did he? Yes. Yes, he did. And the ends of the earth, your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, there's a king part in Paul's call. Be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. Can you imagine Theophilus reading this? Theophilus is a, is, is a most, most excellent, like, you know, powerful person, and he's reading Paul's conversion, and he's saying, hey, I called Paul to call people like you, Theophilus, to repent and kiss the son and honor him in your life. So Paul was, notice something, Paul was very effective in his death, but he'll be way more effective in his life. Now, now why does this matter? Why does this point here matter? Because Beloved, the Apostle Paul did not have a private experience with God so he can walk around helping a bunch of people have a bunch of nice private experiences with God, okay? 
he had a private encounter with God that led to the church so that he would then be a catalyst to lead the church to co conquer and dominate nations, kings, and Israel for the glory of God. This is much more comprehensive. This is much more massive. This is about families, cities, nations, kings, generations. This is Genesis 12. I will bless all the families of the earth through the Abrahamic promise. Genesis 15. You can't count the stars in the sky. That's how far the, the scope of God's grace will go. Daniel chapter 7. And in him was given a glory and a dominion and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. Revelation 5. Beloved, why did Paul go all over the known world in every single place and speak the way that he did was because he was called by a church with a comprehensive kingdom cosmic agenda that went beyond just some privatized personal Jesus experience. Paul did not go in all the world having helping a bunch of people have nice experiences with Jesus. He went into all the world subduing the nations and kings and Gentiles for the glory of God through the things that God had given him. Beloved, I want, I want you to look at your city in light of this. We have Jews all over the city. Read Romans 11 if you think that God's done with ethnic Jews. The Puritans and the Reformers, believe, they, they believe that, yes, we are the new Israel, but God is going to be summoning actual Israel or, or, or ethnic Israel into, into, the, into the final Israel as time goes on. If you read that very clearly, there's, there's Jews all over the city. There's nations all over the city, right? There's Gentiles of all sorts of people in the city, and there's kings in the city. So what do we pray for? What do we long for? That God would use Pinelands and other churches to saturate the city in such a way that nations, kings, and Jews would bow to Jesus and that this city would reflect more of the Lord's will. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in Miami. Why do you talk that way? Because when the apostle Paul is called by the church, he says, he is my instrument to Gentiles, kings, nations, Israelites. This is why the Westminster Larger Catechism says this. I love this. In the second petition, this is question 191, thy kingdom come. We acknowledge ourselves and all mankind to be by nature under the dominion of sin and Satan. We pray that the kingdom of sin and Satan may be destroyed. The gospel propagated, propagated throughout the world. The Jews called. The fullness of the Gentiles brought in. The church furnished with all gospel officers and ordinances. Purged from corruption. Countenanced and maintained by the civil magistrate. That the ordinance of Christ may be purely dispensed. There's this uh, interesting, uh, if you ever want to read something really interesting, read, read the Westminster Directory of Worship. They were a directory of worship, and, and there's, there's this one section where they give instruction about how we are to pray after the sermon. And this is, a, this is a big picture, kingdom-minded stuff. This is not like, I, I pray that I'll have a nice Jesus experience tomorrow or the next, listen. The sermon being ended, the minister is to give thanks for the great love of God and sending his son, Jesus Christ, unto us for the communication of his Holy Spirit, for the light and liberty of the glorious gospel, and the rich and heavenly blessing revealed therein, as namely election, vocation, adoption, justification, sanctification, and the hope of glory, for the admirable goodness of God in freeing the land from anti-Christian darkness and tyranny, and for all national deliverances, for the reformation of religion, for the covenant, and for temporal blessings. That's... Big kingdom perspective mindedness. You know, do you know why we're do you know we're Presbyterians? Because God took over Scotland a long time ago. You know why? You know how God took over Scotland? Because they had men like John Knox say, "Give me Scotland or I die." And he says that every, in every household there was a Bible. In every city there was, there was a pastor. In every place there was, there was the Lord being honored. They had a view of the kingdom that was comprehensive, cosmic, and massive. And they prayed and they labored with the things God had given them to bring that about. I don't know about you. Um, I don't care what I see. 
in America. I don't care what I see in Miami. I was reading the Psalms of my, my son this morning. I don't need, should I read this? Should I read the Psalm? Should I? Let me see if I can find it real quick. Psalms 24. The earth and everything in the world as habits belong to the Lord. We make Saul's of Paul's by kingdom mindedness in the midst of, but here's a third or fourth point. We have to make Saul's come to Paul's, but with rugged readiness, rugged readiness. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. <laughs> Christianity 101. And this is how Paul discipled people when he went somewhere for the first time right away. You know, Paul said to his uh, converts, he strengthened, Acts 14, he strengthened the souls of disciples by encouraging them to continue the faith and saying that the best is yet to come. God's going to prosper you in all sorts of ways. It's going to be totally awesome. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Christianity 101 for Paul when he was planting was Christianity 101 what it was for him. Tell Paul that um, that whole Jesus dying and there's going to be a way he experiences that horizontally as he advances him. You know, Jesus kind of, didn't he tell, prepare us for that kind of thing too? What, what did he say to all the crowds that were all pumped up about him? Like, oh yeah, Jesus, I love Jesus. He's so, so nice and I want him into my life, and if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. See, the call to the kingdom, beloved, is a call to suffer for the glory of God. This is not a social club. This is not a bunch of human philanthropists, just people that are just in the world just to do nice things, like, you know, like that's kind of like the way it kind of can be seen, like sometimes. Um, this is a place where people are equipped for suffering for the glory of God. And that's what Paul hears from the very beginning. This is costly. We're not here to gather a bunch of people that want to just have a religious high and use Jesus like some kind of spiritual ecstasy. That's what happens all the time in the city. People are going to church looking for a spiritual high. Listen, you go to church because you're picking a fight with the dark prince. And you want to be equipped to suffer in a way that glorifies God. Christianity 101 is he will suffer a lot for me. Look what Paul says to Timothy. If you think this is just a Paul thing. It's 1 Timothy 2. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. All who want to live a godly life, he says to Timothy, will suffer. But I love how it's suffering that will be very prosperous, okay? So it's not just kind of like um, endless misery. When you want to think about Acts, think about um, Genesis 3. So the, the, the world is cursed, but God makes a promise. And he says, though, there, though you will work and there will be thistles and, and thorns, you will still produce. You're going to produce through thistles and thorns. Eve, childbearing will be very painful, but guess what? You're still going to produce many children. See, in the book of Acts, we see God producing and advancing fruitfully in the midst of thorns and thistles. So it's not just suffering and agony. It is a suffering as we trust God that is very fruitful and prosperous and will prevail. Beloved, we are called to call and summon people to a kingdom that battles and warfares against darkness doesn't find a third way to avoid the controversy with darkness. I think one of the things that I've, I've noticed, 
why? Help me, church. Like, why, why, why are Christians bringing neo-Marxism and wokeism and, and CRT and all this? Why are they bringing all this stuff in the church, like in the preaching? Like, why are they doing that? Like, why, why are you bringing all this psychological babble talk in the church? Like, like why are you bringing feminism in the church? Like, why are you bringing, like, you know, um, all this LGBTQs? Why, why, why are people doing that? Like, what, what are people doing? Because they don't want to suffer. You don't want to suffer. You want to be a Christian, but you don't want to be controversial. And Paul is from day one. Listen, my glory and fame is controversial, and it will cost you a lot. To remove suffering, you know what Jesus said? I I came to bring a sword. I'm going to divide people groups and households as I conquer them. You know why we suffer the gospel? Because this kingdom is universal. Everywhere we go, whether you're in Saudi Arabia, you're in South Africa, you're in the Bahamas, it's all Christ. And there is no space for any other competing gods. This is a universal kingdom. It's an exclusive kingdom. It's not one of many kings. Jesus is the exclusive, universal, sovereign ruler. And therefore, when we bring people to face that their gods are not gods, and we say you must turn away from those gods and turn to the true God, it comes with controversy and resistance and suffering. Listen, wherever Paul went, there was fruitfulness and suffering. So, beloved, we... We are not, that's what I was talking to uh, my, my pastor friends about uh, pastors and like, you know, they're looking for jobs, you know. Maybe, maybe you're one of those young men, you're looking for a job, looking for a nice package. You said, you know, you know who you are, pastor? You're looking for a war to get into. You're not looking for a job. You're not looking for a package. You're looking for a war to suffer for the most glorious man ever who is God and man because of his sufferings. You are looking for a place to suffer for the glory of God, not have religious things scratch your temporal itches. Why does, why does Paul, after talking about families, Talk about spiritual warfare in Ephesians 6. Wonder why. Because, beloved, the whole Christian life, private, familial, corporate, is a call to warfare with the means of grace that will be very costly. And I I remember, like, um, I remember uh, coming to Miami. And um, the, the month before we came to Miami, like, the house had so much carbon monoxide in it, supposedly, because the pilot wasn't mixed sure right with the gas. It was enough to, like, kill everybody. And, and then we come down here, and, like, I'm driving the truck, and, like, um, I literally park my truck in the, the hotel, and my wife had taken Adonis to the hospital because he, was, he got so sick from something, and he couldn't drink any water. So, like, I'm, like, coming into Miami, like, we almost died in the house because of the, 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 the gas, and then I'm coming in, and I spend the first night in the hospital, I'm like, what is this? And remember, I'm not a charismatic, all right? But I do listen to God through providence, okay? And you know what God told me when I came to Miami? You didn't you, you didn't come down here for, you know, A-degree pastoring. You came down here to suffer for my name. Get that out of your mind right now. You came down here to, to you know, get, get some Aldo fan club and, 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 and get some Pope to preach in and, and, you know, and hang out in the beach with your kids on, the, on, you know, on Saturdays. Uh, you came here to suffer, beloved. And this is so important because so much of what you see in the church is simply to try to adjust, it, adjust and accommodate Christianity so that we don't have to suffer. Well, the way the Lord experienced glory was through suffering. The way his body advances the cause of Christ is with that same analogical paradigm. 
But here's one of two more thoughts that I have, I think. Yeah, I do. It's two, one of two more thoughts. Not just with rugged readiness, but with doxology, with doxology, worship and exaltation of God. Like, why, why do you say that? Because he says, how much he will suffer for my name. It's not just suffering. It's, it's suffering for the, the fame and the value and the glory of, of the name of God, who he is and, and what he has done. Like, like we, we are calling Saul's to Paul's through a rugged readiness that is all about the glorious fame of God, okay? So this is important because a lot of times Christians suffer because you're just, you're, you're, you're just immature. And you're like, oh, I'm suffering for Jesus. No, you're not suffering for Jesus. You're suffering because you're immature and you do stupid things in your household that make people angry. You're suffering because you don't work and now you have money problems. Like, you're not suffering for Jesus, okay? You're suffering because of your hard-headedness. The church is called to suffer for the fame and glory of God. And another thing, beloved, we suffer for the name of Jesus. If I, if I could summarize what 90% of Christian arguments have been in the last two years is you suffer for some, some man's name and, and argue for some man's name. That's easy all the time in the church. What do you say about this person? What do you say about that person? This is my person. Listen, we suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. No man's name is why you suffer. Unless we become a Corinth church. I'm with Paul. I'm with Paulus. He baptized me. No, no, no. Paul says, was I crucified for you? Why are you defending me? <laughs> All right? It's about the glory and the fame of God's name. We suffer because his name, not my name, not a name, is glorious and awesome. Because let's just be honest, beloved. Let's be honest. People are constantly taking God's name and making it common. They're taking God's name and making it common. And so what we do is that we say, God, your name is holy, and therefore I will exalt your name as holy, and I will suffer as people treat you as common as I present you as holy. God's name means that he needs no one. And so, you know, the world tries to present God as a needy God who needs humans. And so if you want to present God as he is, self-existent and needing of no one, he's, he's not worshipped by human hands as though he needed anything. When you present God as self-existent, you will suffer for his name in a world that wants to make him needy. In light of a world that wants to make God need our works to cooperate with him, Listen, you want to know what people hate more than anything? It's God's grace. Because God's grace takes everything out of your hand and says it's all from God. And let me tell you something. The Apostle Paul and Jesus, notice when the people of the day got really mad, you don't keep the law. And Jesus had to become the one who keeps the law for you. And so as we prom prom promote God's name as that which is gracious entirely based upon himself and his giftedness that he gives us, we will suffer for his name. As people try to take some of God's attributes at the expense of the others, and we present God as one and all that he is, beloved, we will suffer for his name. As people try to separate the last the last six commandments from the first four everyone loves everyone loves the last six commandments right everyone loves it but guess what there's only one god and you worship him the way he wants and you take his name very seriously and you rest on his special day and then when you start talking about those six commandments with those first four you will suffer for his name Everyone loves talking about loving your neighbor apart from there is one God who rescues people and you must honor him alone. We will suffer for his name as we present him that way. As people try to make the, the, the cross that is about the, 
the second person of the Trinity, added full humanity to his divinity. And on the cross, he suffered the eternal, righteous wrath of Almighty God. The lake of fire judgment that me and you would experience, he drank the cup of God's justice. And when we preach that, we will suffer for his name because the man wants to take that gospel of God atoning for his holy wrath and make it a therapeutic, sentimentalized gospel. And when you preach that gospel, not the social revolutionary gospel, guess what? You will suffer for his name. When you present God, not as a good luck charm for wealth and power, a good luck charm for America, but you present him as the very point and reason. Like, why do you come to God? Simply because of his worth and fame. And if you come to God for money, for power, for success, for America, if you come to God not for God, you are not coming to God. When you preach that, you will suffer for his name. And that's why we should suffer, beloved. Not because he loves suffering, but because his name is so precious. Let me, let me, let me make a side comment before I, I finish this, this thought. Beloved, I feel like a lot of Christians are suffering for like not the most doxological reasons. Let me, let me explain something to you. Um, some of you, you only are suffering because you're against abortion and against wokeness. I'm not telling you to not be against wokeness and abortion. Y'all heard me talk about abortion a lot of times. That's murder, not health care. But people that don't know God suffer for those things. shouldn't be suffering because you take a stand against feminism and the obliteration of masculinity. You shouldn't be suffering simply because you're against racism where it's legitimately there. Beloved, we suffer most essentially because God is who he says he is. Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me what are you talking about, Aldo? Here, here's, here is what is most deeply tr troubling about us as Christians. Not simply our ethical positions against this and that. Here is the scandal. And I, I'll read the confession here. Uh, it's, it's on, the, doc, it's, it's, it's on, on, on the nature of God. Verse section two. God has all life, glory, blessedness, goodness in and from himself. He alone is all sufficient in and to himself. Not standing in need of any creatures which he has made nor deriving any glory from them, but rather manifesting his own glory in, by, to, and on them. Let me read one more. What is God by the larger catechism? God is spirit in and of himself, infinite in being, glory, blessedness, and perfection, all sufficient, eternal, unchangeable, incomprehensible, everywhere present, almighty, knowing all things, most wise, most holy, most just, most merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundance and goodness and truth. That is why we suffer. We suffer because the character of God, his awesome infinitude and in who he is, we preach it. We proclaim it as we talk about life and race and justice. We exalt the triune God who gets no glory from men, all in himself. And that is the name that is famous by which we suffer for the most. See, people pick and choose and they say, ah. I'm about these things and they're about those things. See, the Christians, we, we, go to, we, we go to Philippians 2. He gave him the name that is above every name. But the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Jesus over marriage. Jesus over self. Jesus over society. Jesus over life. Jesus over everything. He is the name. See, the thing is, 
you could be about these issues and those issues, but here's a quintessential issue. God is the point and the supreme one. And if anything on this planet, anything or any cause takes priority over who God is, you have missed religion. And we suffer for the name of God, for who he is above any and everything. His name is why you suffer. Which means you don't suffer for your name. All right, last point. Boxological, ready ruggedness, God confidence, kingdom mindedness. Here's my last thought with, with word and water. With word and water. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road you were traveling has sent me so I can regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So Ananias left and entered the house, and he placed his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road you were traveling has sent me so you can regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. At once, something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. How is it that the Jewish jihadi Paul, okay, Saul, you know, Jewish jihadi, like he was so jacked up on Pharisaism, he was killing folks, okay? Yeah, he's a terrorist. He's the actual terrorist. You know, the Apostle Paul is a terrorist to the church. How is he going to be Paul? Word, water, and prayer. See that? A man comes with the words from God. Paul is there in prayer, and he administers the side of his saving, renewing, and cleansing grace. The way monstrous uncontrollable, crazy, jihad, Paul, Saul, turns to Paul, is through word, water, and prayer. Don't miss the subtlety there. How do baby murderers become moms? Word, water, and prayer. How do immoral perverse people become godly worshipers. Word, water, and prayer. How do abusive, self-centered men become fathers? Word, water, prayer. How does the Drunkard become sober? How does the debauched who live their lives loosely become someone who has purpose? How do moochers become providers? Word, water, and prayer. You know, a lot of times when, when, when you, you notice something in society, every time something happens now, someone gets killed, someone, someone, something happens, like everyone gets all jacked up and they begin to like, this has to happen, this has to happen, we have to do this, we have to do this. And, 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 and you know what, like, you, you Christians, speaking generally, you, you, you just kind of like follow along in the dance, and you just, you, you just like, like, okay, beloved, when we see everything around us, it doesn't matter what it is. You, you, the, the Apostle Paul story is very instructive. What, what is necessary, the word of, the, of, of, the word of good news followed by signs of his signs and seals of his good news in a local church where people pray to God and rely on him. Like, it really is that simple. But man will always, always, always be very suspicious. How did, how, can you imagine, like, why, why did the Apostle Paul go all over pagan Rome and plant churches and appoint elders and entrust him with the word of God. Why did he do that? Because that's what turned him from jihadi local murderer to a manly, a man of God. And instead of being filled with rage, he was then filled with the spirit and love. 
instead of being a miserable, self-righteous man, he became a man of peace, boasting in Christ's righteousness because he became spirit-filled through word and water. Instead of becoming a man full of self-pity, he became a man of promise. And instead of getting letters from the people in power to persecute Christians, he gets letters from God to edify Christians because he becomes a spirit-filled man through word, water, and prayer. Not a spirit, not a spirit, not, not the spirit without word, water, and prayer. Not word, water, and prayer without the spirit, but a word, water, and prayer through the spirit. You know, something very interesting is um, how the, um, the difference between the Sea of Galilee and, and the Dead Sea, you know, you know the difference? Like the Dead Sea, there's, no, there's, no, there, there's, there's, there's nothing in the Dead Sea, right? Any nerves can, right? It's no, there's nothing in there, there's no life in there. You know why? No, it, does, it receives water, but it doesn't give out water. So in Galilee, like uh, the, the Sea of Galilee, it, it receives and gives water. I think that's, that's really interesting because the, the idea is like, if you're not empty of you, you can't be filled with something that is life-giving. So when, when, when God looks at the Apostle Paul, you got a whole lot of stuff in you, but it, you, you have not yet emptied yourself of yourself. Emptied yourself of your name, of your tribe, of your, of your righteousness, of your willpower. You have not emptied yourself of you. you. You still hold on to all of your titles. But to be a spirit-filled man means that you have now, by God's grace, emptied yourself of everything in yourself so you can be replenished by that which is given to you in Christ. And so he becomes empty of Paul and he becomes filled with Jesus with the fullness of him who works all things in all. And he becomes Paul because now his life is a life of being emptied of self and full of the things that God gives us in the spirit. Listen, you want to know what a church is that is on the right path? It is when these things, word, water, word, water, spirit, and prayer are really high up. And we don't need to give you anything else. Because we know, we know that this is what God uses to turn Saul's to Paul's and everybody else to everybody else. And you want to know when you're not a good place? When you find yourself in the church always needing to add something to these simple things to make Jesus effective. Let me tell you something. I've, I've been a pastor long enough to see myself mocked and laughed out of so many places because I say it's really simple. God saves people. Through the means of grace, God sanctifies people through the means of grace. Word, water, spirit, and prayer is how we work, and that will get you laughed out of many rooms. But here we have Saul to Paul. How? Go to the church. Listen to what that man says in light of what God told him. Pray. Receive the sign of my grace and favor that speaks about you being washing and identified with Christ, death, burial, and resurrection, life, death, burial, and resurrection. Be spirit-filled, and that's how you become a Paul. And that's why we have these confidence in these things. And that's why we're going to do what in a few seconds? We're going to share a sign of God's covenantal favor in Christ. Let me pray. Father, I thank you that that the Apostle Paul's story of conversion and his moving from blindness to sight is not simply for himself, but you said in your word that this would be an example to all who would believe. So, Lord, I pray um, that we would be very encouraged uh, that the most pronounced enemy of your church being subdued so quickly the Apostle Paul did not need a probationary period to go from Saul to Paul. It was 
it was decisively one kingdom to the next, and we see this in the verses to follow. Lord, I thank you that that is our story. You take us out, and you bring us in through word, water, signs, and prayer, all in the power of your spirit. Lord, help us to have a high confidence in your simple ways of working. Lord, I pray that right now, as I am praying, that everyone in this room would think of somebody who they think beyond conversion. I pray you would haunt them with this story of Paul every time they see that person. <laughs> and you would remind them um, that though Ananias had a whole lot to say about Paul, uh, Saul, God had a whole lot more to say about himself. So, Lord, I pray that you would set apart um, these elements that we are about to share in a way that brings us to endure for your name, to rejoice in your name, to be assured in your name, to be unified in your name, Lord God. The Holy Spirit is the one who we trust that makes word, water, and bread effective. So I pray he would use them in this moment. Amen. All right, those who are passing out.